There are many ways in which the body of Christ is strengthened through active ministry. One way is that you'll be driven into the Bible for answers and your knowledge of the word will increase rapidly. Since starting the Fuel Project, there have been many challenges from atheists, Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, Muslims, Freemasons, Hebrew Roots Movement proponents, and even Satanists, to name just a few groups. Each one of these groups has had their own agenda, their own question, their own problem, and sometimes they've been completely unanticipated. Therefore, I found myself being driven to pour over the scriptures for answers in previously unseen ways so that I can give a robust defense of the truth. In other words, the resistance that they have provided has accelerated my own sanctification in the word and led to deeper understanding. Similarly, I've also had the privilege of being part of an Introduction to Christianity course for international students over the past few years. These students, mainly from Asia, have communist or Buddhist backgrounds and I've heard questions from them that I've never heard anyone ask before. Because of that, I've been driven into the Bible, not just out of mere intellectual curiosity, but because I need the information within to help the students with answers. Their eternal salvation is on the line, so I want to have the verses to hand, and I want a fuller understanding of various subject matters so I'm not left stumped again in future. I can think back to several occasions when, having just finished an evening with the international students, all I've been able to think about is racing home to open my Bible because a question was raised that got my mind whirring and I've been desperate to know the answer. While reading the Bible is an act of the will that will sometimes require self-discipline, you will find that as you apply what you're learning, you will increasingly come to the Bible out of desire, excitement or even sheer desperation rather than duty. Imagine if a soldier was being trained to use a weapon but was told he would never be sent into battle to use it. He could be quite half-hearted about his training, knowing that it wouldn't make a huge difference to his life in the long run. But imagine a soldier is trained with a weapon and told that he'll be going to the front line within two weeks. You can bet that that soldier will be intensely focused on being the best that he can possibly be with that weapon. The Bible is our spiritual weapon. The writer to the Hebrews calls it a sharp double-edged sword. And when we know that we're going to be sent to the front lines with it, we're going to focus more intensely in training ourselves with it. Another area of sanctification that will accelerate through practical ministry is in regard to prayer. When we're getting ourselves into tight situations or confronting real spiritual enemies or attempting great things for God, we will find that our prayers are no longer full of empty rhetoric, trite platitudes or vain repetition. Instead, we will find that our prayers become passionate, pleading and authentic, exactly like Jesus, of whom it was said that while he was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with loud cries and tears to the one who could rescue him. In general, we have no cause to pray prayers like that because we're not getting ourselves into situations where it's needed. The Bible records Peter being taken into prison for preaching the gospel and it says, But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The key word here is earnestly. It means with added intensity. Where did the intensity come from? Obviously because one of their number desperately needed God to come through for him. This wasn't some abstract or hypothetical prayer now. It was focused and full of intent. Similarly, you'll find through practical ministry that you become ready to wrestle with God in prayer for as long as it takes because in faith you've attempted great things beyond your human capabilities and you know that you'll fail unless he comes through for you. You'll become totally dependent on God and find that you need his power. This is a scary but excellent situation to be in. When you come to the end of yourself, you find the beginning of God and you'll find him coming through for you in miraculous ways. Similarly, when we're willing to go to the front lines and apply our training, our praise ceases to be mere ritualistic ceremony or hypocritical show. Like the 72 who returned from their mission brimming with joy, faith and excitement because they'd witnessed Jesus' power and glory with their own eyes, we will experience a similar thing in our own lives. When we come to sing before the Lord, it will be real, raw, authentic, extravagant and spontaneous because we've just witnessed a hardened atheist find salvation. We've just seen a demon cast out. We've just seen someone healed. We've just seen prayers answered. No longer will God have reason to turn away from our worship, calling it hypocritical and false, as he did to Israel through Isaiah. Instead, our very lives will be like a sweet fragrance rising up to God and our praise will be an overflow out of our joyful hearts. And finally, 
When we're engaged in battle like this, we will simply have no time for divisive idle gossip. We will have too much to be getting on with to be bothered with trivial arguments. When one of our number has just been arrested on hate speech charges for speaking against homosexuality in public or proclaiming that there's no other way to heaven except but through Christ, and when we have to assemble to pray and petition for that man's freedom like the early church did for Peter, petty arguments about whether he was wearing a tie at the time of his arrest start to look ridiculous. When ten people have given their lives to the Lord because one of our number has been handing out gospel tracts in public, the version of the Bible being used on them becomes of secondary importance. When one of our number has been asked a particularly tough question by an atheist that he couldn't answer and he brings it to the group to discuss because this man's salvation is at stake, arguments about the church sanctuaries, lilies and tulips start to move down our list of priorities. We will become more attractive people to be around. The reverse economy of God's kingdom means that the best way to improve ourselves is to try to help others. Through such things we'll learn to keep things in perspective. We'll learn humility. People will come to know the Lord Jesus through us. Our numbers will grow. Our faith will strengthen. We too will turn from lambs into lions. We'll turn into the type of disciples who are ready to lay down our lives for Christ. We will find bonds of unity growing. We'll be one body, one spirit, authentic, real, a band of brothers and sisters that need one another with all our faults and frailties and idiosyncrasies just to get by. This is what church should look like. And isn't this the kind of church that everybody wants? Chuck Swindle said, In vain I have searched the Bible, looking for examples of early believers whose lives were marked by rigidity, predictability, inhibition, dullness and caution. Fortunately, grim, frowning, joyless saints and scriptures are conspicuous by their absence. Instead, the examples I find are of adventurous, risk-taking, enthusiastic and authentic believers whose joy was contagious even in times of full trial. Their vision was broad even when death drew near. Rules were few and changes were welcome. The contrast between then and now is staggering. I believe that we can rediscover all that made the early church so winsome if we are just willing to go out. Indeed, there is nothing to lose by it and everything to gain.